All right, guys. So in this video, uh, I wanted to do another kind of breakdown on taxes. I have spoken on taxes uh, before briefly. Again, keep in mind, I will say the, uh, the 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 required disclaimer that I'm not a tax specialist and none of this is tax advice. So uh, just keep that in mind. But uh, I'm here to kind of educate you on how taxes work, uh, specifically in the U.S., right? So if, you, if you're outside of the U.S., uh, you're in Europe or elsewhere, this won't apply to you. Uh, there might be some similarities, but more often than not, it's pretty different uh, for you. Uh, now, if you're in Canada, like me, uh, there is some similarities. There is some relevance here uh, because although the the brackets are different, uh, the, the marginal tax rates are different, the system is very similar uh, with a few uh, minor differences that I will touch on. Uh, so let's kick things off. Uh, I felt like a lot of people uh, in the U.S. and Canada and North America do not understand the tax system. And there's a lot of misconception, misinformation, and lack of education around the tax system and how it operates. So uh, I figured I'd do a bit of a, a, a breakdown. So here we go. Um, first things first, right? Getting rid of this kind of um, notion that people think that whatever tax bracket they fall into, they, for whatever reason, think that their entire income is simply taxed at that percentage. So if someone makes um, 100000 or $150,000 and, and they maybe fall into the 22 or 25 or 27 percent tax bracket, they think their entire 100K or 150K is taxed at 27 percent, which is not the case, right? And this brings us to the marginal tax system, which is the same system that's used in the U.S. and Canada. Like I said, it's relevant. Otherwise, the other systems are different in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, so with the marginal tax system, your income is broken down into sections, so transits, right? So only that portion of that income is taxed at those individual rates. And it's going to make more sense as I get into it, right? There's this myth that People always say, look, I don't want to work more. I don't want to make more or, or I don't want to make more money in the market. Or if I make capital gains, what's the point? You know, I make money in the market. The government takes almost all of it anyway. So they shy away from making more because they think they're going to, most of it's going to go into to, to taxes when that's not the case, right? Making more will move you up in the tax brackets, causing you to tax, get taxed more. That's what people think. The reality is that if you start earning more, yes, you move up the tax bracket. But the marginal amount, essentially the money that is in the higher tax bracket is taxed at the higher rate, not the entire amount you earn. Okay, this is a very key distinction. And I'm going to share with you visually the federal tax brackets, okay, with you for 2023. Is this, uh, I hope this is clear for those of you that are on live. Um, so, you know, let me know in the chat if it is um, not, but uh, I'm hoping this is clear. So ultimately the 2023 tax brackets for single filers. If you are a joint filer or head of the household, it will be a bit different, but it's actually more beneficial uh, if you are, but single filers are a little bit less tax, uh, I would say, efficient. But hey, let's, for simplicity's sake, here we are. So we got the tax brackets here, right? So hope you see the cursor, the tax rate, the brackets uh, here. And then you can see the income side of it. Right. So if you make, let's say, 10K. All right. If you make 10K in the year, you're paying 10 percent. You're in the first bracket. It's simple. You're paying 10 percent on that. Right. Now, think about those that make, you know, maybe 11,000 above 11,001 to 44,725. So $44,725. dollars OK, so what you're doing is you're paying, uh, you know, eleven hundred dollars for uh, the first bracket plus. 12% of the amount between 11,001 to 44,725. And that's how it goes. So you only pay the percentage here on the excess amount. Okay. So people think, oh, I made $95,000. So I'm going to pay all 95,000 at 22%. No, the first 11,000 of that income, you're paying 10%. Then the rest of that for the you know, 11,001 to 44,000, you're paying 12% on that. And then above 44,726 to 95,375, which you would be in, right? You That's your max because you're 95,000 income. 
you're paying 22%, right? So that's the difference. And it goes all the way to $578,126 and higher. And that's the 37%. Remember, this is federal, right? This is the federal tax bracket. Depending on what state you're in, uh, you might have another 5% or so, uh, depending on what state you're in. If you're in a state like Florida, Texas, um, that doesn't have state income tax, and then that's zero. This is it, right? Whereas if you're in a state like New York or elsewhere, you'll have a little bit of uh, uh, more, right? This is the 2024 for, for those of you for reference for the, the following year. So at the time of this video, this recording, we're in 2023. So the 2023 numbers is what you're going to be paying uh, in the new year. So at come April time, at tax time, this is what you're going to be paying, right? So remember, it's always the year prior, right? So in 2024, April time, you're going to have paid for 2023's tax bracket, the 20 uh, tax bracket numbers. For 2024, uh, these are the numbers. And then in 2025, in April, you're going to be paying for 2024's, okay? So keep that in mind. And here, I've gone ahead and done another example for you. So if someone is making 100K gross income from their job, okay, single filer, and they're living in the state of Florida. So like I said, Florida has no income tax and so no state income tax. Here's an example. So if someone makes 100K, they automatically think they're going to be paying because they fit into the, you know, 24% um, tax bracket, they're going to be paying 24% on 100K. So they are thinking they're going to pay 24 grand in taxes just on the federal level uh, when that's not the case. It's actually less, right? So when you think about it, you're actually paying about 14.77% in tax not the 24% people think. If you think about it at the end of the day, that's a bit of a difference, right? Again, it's simpler because you don't have state taxes in, in Florida. Uh, and the same would be the case in Texas. Uh, but if you take a look here, the marginal tax rate is 22%. The effective rate is 14.77. So the actual total federal tax rate, tax you're paying is about 14,000 on $100,000 income. Okay, not 24K or not 22K. It's 14,000. And that's simplistic. That's not including, you know, if you contributed to your 401k uh, you, or you, you know, put anything in your IRA, Roth IRA. That's not, you know, keeping things very simple. Um, just simply income and then what you're taxed on. Okay. So at the end of the, the year, you know, you're keeping uh, roughly 85% uh, of your income on a 100K salary. Not too bad, right? Not too, too bad. Now, for those of you, just to kind of compare and contrast, if someone were to live in New York, again, a little bit of higher tax rate because you have the state taxes, not as high as California state, but you get the point uh, to compare and contrast to something like Florida. Uh, same thing, $100,000 income. You got, uh, you know, single filer, New York state. You got the same 14.7% um, effective tax rate, but you also have a 5.2% tax rate um, effective tax rate for the state. So in the total, instead of keeping about 85,000, you're keeping 80,000 at the end of the year total on a $100,000 income. Not ideal, not better than Florida, but not the end of the world. People literally tell me I'm making a hundred K. Uh, so that means, you know, I'm going to be left with 50 K. Mm, I mean, I don't know what Scandinavian country you're living in, if that's the case, but that's not that's not the case if you're living in a place even like New York, right? Um, you're still keeping about eighty percent of your income, right? So there's this big big misconception of taxes. Like I get it, no one likes paying taxes, you know, and taxes are too damn high all the time. I get it, but and they always keep going up. But it's not the end all be all, right? And I wanted to do this brief primer on kind of how the U.S. And, and, and to an extent, the Canadian tax system works, the marginal tax system. It's important. People do not understand it. It boggles my mind. Uh, because if you don't understand how this works, then it's, you're not going to understand how capital gains taxes work. And as a result, tax loss harvesting, which brings us to just that. So what is tax loss harvesting? So I've spoken about it before, but again, uh, I will retouch on it. Tax loss harvesting is essentially the selling of your stocks, right, or even options, uh, at a loss, if you have it in the loss and you're carrying it, you're essentially selling it or closing it to offset any capital gains tax owed. So 
really, this is used to limit short-term capital gains, right? Which is usually taxed at a higher rate than long-term capital gains to preserve, you know, your your kind of value of your portfolio, but ultimately is to pay less tax. Now, to keep things simple, we're going to assume that all the examples are for short-term capital gains, right? The way capital gains in the U.S. works is if you have short-term capital gains, they're taxed at your marginal tax rate. So if you have capital gains of 50000 short-term, think of it like applying to your income, right? So instead of making hundred k and you made 50000 in taxable uh, capital gains short-term, your total income would be 150. Think of it like that way, okay? Uh, in Canada, it's a little bit different. Uh, because we don't have the differentiation between short term and long term, we just have a simple, uh, clear cut uh, capital gains tax where fifty percent of that gain is put towards your marginal tax rate. So we don't pay a fifty percent tax; only fifty percent of that is applied to the marginal tax rate, right? So continuing on, uh, what people also get confused about is if you have capital losses, people think, oh, I can only take capital losses max of 3,000. The 3,000 is actually there to offset your income. So if you made 100K here, all right, you could decrease that 100K by 3,000, max 3,000 for one year if you have over 3,000 in capital losses for the year, okay? Uh, I hope that's none of you here. Uh, you know, uh, losses is part of the game, but ideally you wanna have capital gains. But tax loss harvesting allows us to effectively keep more of our tax money by booking the losses to offset the gains, right? So here's an example, okay? So assume that an investor has sold their investments realizing a short-term capital gain. The investor sold, okay, these shares. So like they bought 1,000 shares of ABC stock at $50, K, uh, $50 per share. So that they bought $50,000 worth of stock, uh, ABC stock. And then they sold it for $80 per share, okay? That's $30 per share. Uh, capital uh, gain, right? So they sold $80,000 worth, $30,000 capital gain. Another trade, they bought 1,000 shares of a XYZ stock for $75, that's 75K worth, right? And then they sold it for $100 per share, 100K worth. So they made 25K. So total, they made $55,000 capital gains for the year. Just think, pretend that these are the only two trades that they've done. So how do capital gains work? You take the closed trades. Remember, the trade has to be closed. The gain has to be booked. So they closed these two trades. Total, they sold for more than they bought the gain, right? 30K plus 25K, that's a total of $55,000 in short-term capital gains, right? So what does that mean? This is going to be put towards their marginal tax bracket, okay, uh, in the U.S. Again, this is applicable to the U.S. and assuming it's a short-term capital gain. What's a short-term capital gain? any trade that's opened and closed within a span of a year. If you hold a, a position open and then close it for a profit after a year, calendar year, or I should not a calendar year, but one year's time frame, then that applies as long-term capital gains. And that could be taxed uh, at 20% uh, or even 10%, depending on uh, your income level. So here's an example using the numbers from above. So if you are this individual who made $55,000 in, in capital gains for the year, and you make $100,000 income as well, okay? So total purchase price of all the stocks that they bought was 125 k and then total selling was 180 k right? So you made 55 k I'm just using the exact same numbers from here, all right? What happens then? Plus you have an income of 100 k and then we're using the 2023 uh, tax brackets. Total income is 155 k Right, as I said, we're assuming it's a short-term gain, uh, capital gain, and it's a single filer. Here is your taxes for that on a hundred and fifty-five thousand dollar total, okay, including your capital gains. Your estimated federal tax, okay, uh, total, okay, including your capital gains is thirty k. So you made one hundred fifty-five k that year including your capital gains, and then you owe the government 30600 Okay? Not great, but not too bad, right? Uh, the government's got to, Uncle Sam's got to get a share. So here is the marginal tax rate uh, for the federal. That's the total, right? So here comes in tax loss harvesting. If you have losses in this case, so keeping with the same numbers, 
you know, you made a 55K capital gain. What if you have losses? It makes sense to take those losses because you have 55,000 in net capital gain. So in this case, assume you bought EFG stock at 55 and then you have sold it for a loss, okay? At $30 per share, you lost 25K on that one. You also bought a thousand shares of QRS stock, again, as an example, at $100 per share, and then you sold it at $60 per share. Okay, you lost $40 per share, total of $40,000. So that's a $65,000 loss. So what do you do? You have the $55,000 capital gain for the year, and then you have a $65,000 loss for that same year. That results in a net capital loss of $10,000. Okay, that's how the capital gain system works. People think taxes, it blows my mind. People think to this day that they pay tax when they take money out of the brokerage account. I'm like, no, taking money out makes no difference. You know, you could keep all your money in like me uh, throughout the year and it doesn't mean you don't pay tax. You know, I got I to gotta have a big tax bill uh, this year. You know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not happy about it, but at least, you know, I made money, right? So, Here's the scenario. You have to look at your total end of the year. Do you have a net capital gain? Do you have losses that you're sitting on that you haven't booked? Book those losses. Could the stock come back? Yeah, but you're better off booking them to offset your taxes, right? Your capital gain. So in this scenario, the investor who didn't book any losses and didn't tax loss harvest, well, they're going to have to pay, you know, uh, total tax about 3200 on that $55,000 capital gain. Now, if you're smart, like I'm showing you here, you book those losses to offset and then you end up with a net loss. Again, not good. Okay, hopefully no one uh, watching this. But as an example, if you end up with a net loss, well, guess what? You don't pay taxes on net capital losses, right? Instead, what you can do is if you have that 10,000 net loss, you can take 3,000 out of that $10,000 that can offset your income, your 100K salary, you decrease it by three grand, right? And then the other 7K of this 10K loss, you can carry forward. So next year, if you made, assuming simplistically, you made 7K in capital gains, you have a carry forward loss of 7,000, that cancels out. You don't pay any capital gains tax next year, okay? So in a nutshell, this is a quick and dirty example and a primer on taxes and capital gains. I know I went through a lot for the elite members. I will share this uh, document here for you to refer to again uh, with the examples here. But ultimately, understanding taxes is very important. You don't need to be a tax specialist. Again, this isn't applicable uh, to every single person's scenario. It's not tax advice. Uh, but simplistically speaking, um, it's not rocket science. Uh, it's not as complex as people make it out to be. But it's also not sometimes what people think it is. Uh, people have no idea that, you know, if you have capital losses of more than 3,000, that's fine. You can carry forward the rest perpetually forever. Uh, so, you know, if you've lost 50K, you can carry that forward in the next year. And then if you make, you know, money next year in capital gains, you offset that, right? So it's very important to understand this because, Guess what? Even if you have an accountant, which I do recommend you have a good CPA, uh, at least you understand how your your finances, your money is being used, uh, whether it's um, for taxes or what you're keeping at the end of the day. Thanks for, for, for paying attention and uh, share this video for someone who you think could benefit from getting a bit of an understanding of how taxes work. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.